this is Milton Friedman back around that time on one of his shows, I'm Free to Choose, talking about the issue of prescription drugs. And I want to play this clip to help us set the stage for today's program. The implications for the patients are that therapeutic decisions that used to be the preserve of the doctor and the patient are increasingly becoming made at a national level by committees of experts. And these committees and the agency for whom they are acting, the FDA, are highly skewed towards avoiding risks. So there's a tendency for us to have drugs that are safer, but not to have drugs that are effective. Uh, now, I've heard some remarkable statements from some of these advisory committees in considering drugs. Uh, one has seen the statement, there are not enough patients with a disease of this severity to warrant marketing this drug for general use. Now, that's fine if what you're trying to do is to minimize drug toxicity for the whole population. But if you happen to be one of these not enough patients uh, and you have a disease that is of high severity or disease that's very rare, then that's just tough luck on you. It's no accident that despite the best of intentions, the Food and Drug Administration operates so as to discourage the development and prevent the marketing of new and potentially useful drugs. Put yourself in the position of a bureaucrat who works over there. Suppose you approve a drug that turns out to be dangerous, a thalidomide. Your name is going to be on the front page of every newspaper. You will be in deep disgrace. On the other hand, suppose you make the mistake of failing to approve a drug that could have saved thousands of lives. Who will know? The people whose lives might have been saved will not be around. Their relatives are unlikely to know that there was something that could have saved their lives. A few doctors, a few research workers, they will be disgruntled. They will know. You or I, if we were in the position of that bureaucrat, would behave exactly the same way. Our own interest would demand that we take any chance whatsoever, almost, of refusing to approve a good drug in order to be sure that we never approve a bad one. Milton Friedman making a very strong case for making sure that the Food and Drug Administration and the government's role when it comes to prescription drugs is really limited. Particularly because in the past we have seen historically governments have prevented people from being able to access potentially life-saving drugs. And now, here in the United States of America today, we're seeing something seemingly similar to that. When it comes to the hydroxychloroquine discussion, which will factor in to our first conversation of the day here on Jimmy at the Crossroads on a free to choose Friday, I am pleased to welcome back to the program ophthalmologist and former congresswoman for New York's 19th congressional district, good friend of the show, Nan Hayworth returns as we discuss on this free to choose Friday about the importance of the doctor patient relationship of limiting the role of government and interfering in that relationship. And also a little bit about the censoring of information that is counter narrative to what the media and other elites, shall we say, would like to see presented exclusively. Nan Hayworth, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Jimmy. It's great to be with you. And you have, as always, uh, stated the uh, case for the current uh, challenge uh, cogently. Well, I appreciate that. And that's why I wanted to have you on to help amplify these points. So first of all, I just want to get your thoughts on where we're at with COVID-19 and the spread of the virus. I mean, it used to be that your home state, my original home state of New York, was mm -hmm. the hot button place. I mean, that was the the area where things were just seemingly never getting better. And eventually they did, uh, in part, for example, after Cuomo got rid of his stupid policy, telling uh, elderly people that they must stay in their retirement homes. Uh, or nursing mm -hmm. homes after getting COVID-19, which was just absolutely absurd. But other parts of the country now seem to be replicating the experience of New York earlier on. And I'm curious your thoughts on where we're at right now, first of all. Uh, Jimmy, look, we know this is a highly contagious virus. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, it, it does mutate. Uh, and it mutates fairly 
constantly. That is uh, in the nature of viral behavior. Uh, so one of my colleagues who's got his finger on the pulse uh, mentioned to me that uh, the current observation, and I had seen this in a news story as well, uh, seems to be that while uh, there's a new strain of the virus that is uh, more effective at uh, transmitting itself among humans, you know, even better than its antecedents, uh, it doesn't seem to make people as sick. It's not as virulent. So, you know, if you if you get it, it's sort of like, you know, a tree falls in the forest and you, <laughs> there's no other trees around it. I don't hear that. No harm, no foul. So, you know, if, you, if you're acquiring the virus uh, and still uh, generating immunity to what's uh, most uh, damaging to your body about the virus, uh, then you're in good shape. So uh, it, while the, the number of cases has dramatically uh increased in some parts of the country. Uh, the rate of death has not uh, increased to the same extent. And that's good news. Yeah, that is absolutely. One of the things that we are better prepared to do now is handle a lot of the influx in the hospitals. Now, there are some that are seemingly reaching capacity now in certain areas, at least for where they have in their wards for uh, specifically for COVID-19 treatments. But one thing that I think is so important, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more with Jenny Beth Martin of Tea Party Patriots in the next segment, Nan Hayworth, but when it comes to hydroxychloroquine and the different treatments that are available, one of the things that's important is treating a patient early in the process. When they've first been diagnosed, you understand that they're going to be going through the symptoms or having these challenges. You want to provide them treatment more quickly. And one of the things that's important about this hydroxychloroquine with some combination, that kind of discussion, is that nobody's saying that later on when somebody's pretty far into a COVID-19 fight that this is going to be some sort of cure for them. But if you get mm -hmm. prescribed this medication early on, as Dr. Rish, at the, uh, a professor of epidemiology at the Yale School of Public Health, has pointed out in a Newsweek piece, shocked that Newsweek even published it in the first place, but they did. Yeah. He points out that if you catch them early and give them the right dosage, it can be dramatic. In fact, he says that this is the key to defeating COVID-19. Right. Uh, and now, Dr. Rich uh, it certainly is a, a very learned uh, scholar of epidemiology. And obviously, he's on a, you know, an august faculty. So I and if when you read his uh, writings on this subject, uh, they're thoroughly documented. You know, mm -hmm. he dissects uh, the evidence. Uh, he recognizes uh, where it is, uh, you know, less rigorous in terms of the kinds of studies uh, that are published, the kinds of observational mm -hmm. theories uh, that are published. It's not the same as the, the quote-unquote gold standard, which is a double-blinded uh, study of uh, an intervention versus a non-intervention or an alternative intervention. We really don't have, uh, you know, because of the urgency of this uh, disease and the fact that we don't have uh, a great standard therapy or, you know, a, a standard therapy that, you know, has met the test of time in a, at least a reasonably satisfactory way, right? So we are we are doing all we can with all due speed to try to determine, uh, you know, we're we're uh, we're building this thing as we use it. Mm -hmm. uh, so with all of that said, Dr. Rich has concluded most forcefully that hydroxychloroquine is uh, a, a medication that can be effective. Yes, uh, more so when it is used earlier mm -hmm. in the course uh, of the disease. Uh, and and it, access should be available to providers. And, and you know, uh, Jimmy, that's the point that I've made from the get go is that, you know, we, we need to allow uh, this. Basically, this uh, it, this is the, the most uh, the most massive uh, scaled right to try situation this country has ever faced. Mm. And this is you know, the history's biggest right to try. Let doctors try this. That's it. That's it. There is no reason. And Jimmy, there is zero rationale uh, mm -hmm. for for not allowing free access by providers 
Uh, and this week, uh, the, the state of Ohio, Governor DeWine, uh, just, just rescinded yesterday, uh, on Thursday, the state of Ohio health department's decree that hydroxychloroquine would not be available for providers uh, on an outpatient basis. And I was among the many who commented on this in the public uh, arena. And of course, he read my tweet and said, well, that's it. But, but seriously... <laughs> Um, you know, there are Dr. Rich has said there are 44 states currently, New York being one of them, that have restrictions on uh, prescribing hydroxychloroquine. And and that's that's just not medically supportable. You know, we should have access. Yeah. And look, bringing up Dr. Rich, he has authored more than 300 peer reviewed publications. He holds senior positions on the editorial boards of several leading journals. And he does point to a number of different instances, studies and real-world applications of this, particularly, again, early on in the course. Right. And that, that's important to keep in mind. But I just, I want to get to this fundamental point, Dr. Nan Hayworth, because we're on Free yeah. to Choose Friday today. And the idea right. of the government getting in the way when we've got a drug that has been on the market for 65 years. OK, we're talking about hydroxychloroquine right. here with combination with zithromycin and, you know, whatever that is, or zinc. It's but big, the yeah. point is, for like 65 years, this has been a drug that has been used in some countries. It's available over the counter. You shouldn't be right. having the government get in the way of a drug like this. No, I agree. Uh, and and we've talked about it before, Jimmy. You've led great discussions on the role of the FDA mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, of where it, it sets its uh, limitations and where it sets the bar. And it's, uh, there, there's a safety uh, aspect that is paramount, uh, and there's an efficacy aspect that has unfortunately stood in the way of uh, some therapies that may only work in a very small number of patients but could work powerfully well, uh, not actually becoming available as they should. Uh, and in the case of hydroxychloroquine, actually, the FDA approved it decades ago, as you point out. Uh, and in fact, the evidence that has been marshaled against its safety uh, has been retracted because, in fact, those data were falsified. Uh, so, you know, studies published in The Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine in, I believe it was maybe April or May, that, that said, oh, oh, nope, can't use hydroxychloroquine, it hurts the heart in people with, with COVID-19. Well, guess what? Not true, not valid. The problem, Jimmy, that we have, and it, it goes back to politics in a different way and to government, the abuse of government power in a different way, is that hydroxychloroquine in specific has been politicized, has been weaponized because President Donald Trump very early on uh, urged that it be uh, broadly available as a potentially effective therapeutic. And that is why the media and academia and the public health establishment uh, their, their animus against Donald Trump is so deep and so, uh, and so strong that, that they have set themselves against this. And I, I do think even if it's subliminal, it's because they do not want to validate a thought that Donald Trump might have. I think that's so true. And even Dr. Rish in his piece for Newsweek makes that same observation. But since you mentioned the cardiac issues, I do want to read a, a couple sentences from this Newsweek op-ed that uh, uh, Dr. Rish of the Yale School of Public Health wrote. He points out about an Oxford study of more than 320,000 older patients taking both hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin who had arrhythmia, yeah. excess, uh, uh, excess death rates of less than 9 out of 100,000 users, as I discussed in right. my May 27th paper cited above. A new paper in the American Journal of Medicine by established cardiologists around the world yeah. fully agrees with this. In other words, yeah. he's talking about how hydroxychloroquine in terms of its safety relative to, to treating patients – is, is demonstrable, and even cardiologists who know a thing or two about the heart, Dr. Nan Hayworth, right. they agree with of him. Of course. Right. And so do, so do prominent rheumatologists who have used hydroxychloroquine in their patients with autoimmune diseases uh, for decades yeah. uh, and on thousands and thousands, millions of patients. 
the safety signals for hydroxychloroquine are extremely reassuring, including COVID-19. And this entire matter uh, is strictly based on politics. And everyone in this country should be deeply concerned when one party, the Democratic Party, when a media apparatus and academia and the public health establishment are and, and popular culture are aligned mm. against a potentially effective therapeutic because they cannot stand that what they see as the political implications of its use and success. And it has been successful across the world. And that's, of course, one of the big uh, you know, oceans of evidence to which Dr. Risch points. When you look at, when you rough out uh, now, you know, we, we have to bear in mind, of course, that, you know, the statistics are not uh, pristine, to say the least, even in the United States. You know, there, there, there are so much noise in the data. But roughly, when you broadly categorize uh, death rates uh, from COVID in populations across the world, mm-hmm. it, it does certainly seem to correlate broadly right. that where hydroxychloroquine has been welcomed and utilized. It has resulted in demonstrable benefits, or at the very least is correlated with lower death rates. Uh, Dr. Nan Hay, with just a few minutes left at the end, I appreciate your time today, as always, my friend. So uh, I just want to clarify that the, the paragraph that I read through wasn't about hydroxychloroquine applied to COVID-19 patients, but in terms of older people who yeah, have been yeah, treated right. for other circumstances. And that's what you can use yeah. as a proxy in terms of determining safety. It's not like COVID-19 suddenly changes the whole nature of how safe a drug that's been around for 65 years is. Um, well, Jimmy, I will, I will, uh, or is it? I will offer a qualifier. It on can that. be, you know, okay. every, well, right. Every disease uh, has a different set of mechanisms and pathologies or its own distinct set. Mm-hmm. So it, 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 it's also unmistakable that COVID-19 does target the vascular system and has adversely affected the heart, particularly, yes, as you say, you know, there is certainly, a, a, you know, a, a folks who are, who are elderly, who have cardiovascular, you know, that the prevalence of cardiovascular disease in that population is far greater than in younger people. So, Yes, that, you know, that does correlate uh, with the potential cardiac complications, presumably of any medication or any regimen. Uh, but that said, COVID yeah. may have additional pathology within the heart. And that's been the argument. OK, uh, you know, that well, well, we I appreciate the chance, but that has not. Oh, no, you bet, Jimmy. But in fairness, important. that really hasn't particularly been. Yes. yes can I that can I say it's borne out? Yeah. You know, well, but the other thing words, is it's, it's done OK. Yeah, a doc, sorry to interrupt, but a doctor's doctor is going to assess your risk profile, and so if they think that exactly. these potential heart issues could actually apply, given what you were just describing about COVID nineteen, right. they might not prescribe it to you. That's the doctor making right. that decision because exactly. they know your condition. Exactly, that's the whole thing. Clinical discretion. You know what? But but what those who want to eliminate access to hydroxychloroquine. I'll give you the analogy. It's like saying, you know what? Uh, When you drive, you could be severely injured or even killed in a car accident. And we know this happens every day across the country. Our recommendation to you is that we take away everyone's keys so no one can get in the car. Seriously. I mean, that's, that's kind of the analogy there. Right. No, I think, I think there's a known risk to any, action any intervention and it, this is of a piece yeah. with the moving of goalposts in 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 our nation's uh addressing the covid challenge originally the the goal was to prevent the crush uh, of demand on icus and everybody understands that and and we mm-hmm. don't want to see one person die of this i'm so and nobody is trivializing that but there is no year in this country in which Americans do not die by the tens of thousands from infectious diseases. Mm-hmm. You know, and that that has happened throughout time immemorial, including influenza, with well, which we are all very familiar. Sure. And, and one thing that I will throw at you, too, is that, look, if, if hydroxychloroquine in these combinations is effective early on in the course you could prevent right. hospitalizations and hospitals from being yes, overflowed right. by treating Precisely. patients with this in the time period with which it can Precisely. be 
the most effective. A- absolutely. Right. We're just I know we're just about out of time with you, Dr. Nan Hayworth, our guest, former congresswoman from New York State. Uh, just two quick final questions for you. Number one, what do you make of this Frontline Doctors Summit? We're about to talk with uh, Jenny Beth Martin here yeah. on the show. She helped yeah. organize that event, but particularly the yeah. fact that social media outlets have been taking down this week a number of videos right. from that event, especially the press conference. It's selective silencing. It's selective silencing of anything that might conceivably uh, lend to what the uh, social media giants perceive as uh, favorable to the right side of the political aisle, favorable to the Republican Party, favorable to Donald Trump. They will, they, their criteria for censorship uh, and for silencing uh, are far more uh, stringent when it comes to so-called conservative uh, or you know, conservative supporting positions than they are uh, versus uh, any alternative. And final question for you again, former Congresswoman Nan Hayworth, our guest, uh, John Lewis, late congressman, yes. now John Lewis just passed away, and yesterday was his eulogy, and his, Barack Obama gave a eulogy, former president of the United States, and there was his, obviously yes. his funerals where that took place, and President Obama Seem to get a little bit political while recognizing the life and legacy of John Lewis. You served in Congress. He was a member of Congress at the time. Um, what mm-hmm. do you make of the words that President, what did he say and what do you make of it? Well, President Obama, uh, uh, among, you know, President Obama's uh, reasonably adroit. I'll, I'll give him that. He delivers a speech well, but he's reasonably adroit at, uh, uh, concealing his uh, fundamental, uh, what I refer to as his subtle but distinct uh, insurrectionist uh, <laughs> uh, uh, sensibilities. You know, he's the Weather Underground's most successful pupil, uh, and he uh, assailed uh, law enforcement uh, being uh, brought to bear. They're, they're uh, specifically referred to tear gas and batons. Uh, which obviously are, uh, you know, are more forceful instruments used to control, oh, rioting. Uh, But he referred to them being deployed versus peaceful protesters, so-called peaceful protesters. Uh, That's not how they're being used. That's not what law enforcement is doing. Uh, And and that is a calumny. And Mm -hmm. and he expects to be uh, to be heard and respected because the media and uh, elites uh, have always been deferential to him. Hmm. Dr. Nan Hayworth, former congresswoman for the 19th Congressional District of New York, you have one of the best vocabularies of any guest what? we have ever had at any point in time here on Jimmy at the Crossroads, <laughs> and, I, and I appreciate it very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will tell you, Jimmy, when I was a, an infant in, uh, you know, in 1960 and my mother took photographs of me in, uh, in my little uh, playpen, which we used to use in those days, uh-huh. I would literally chew on books. So there you go. Uh, they were just starting right instantly. It's kind of like me with yep. blues. I came home from the hospital. First song I there ever heard go. as a newborn was uh, Mary Had a Little Lamb uh, blues rock tune by <laughs> the late, great yeah. Stevie Ray Vaughan, and I he's been oh, my favorite ever it. since. So, you know, that's just it's kind of how there it works. Go. Nan Hayworth, that's thank it. you thank you so much for taking the time today. Happy Free to Choose Friday, and uh, have a great weekend. You too, Jimmy. Thanks for your voice. It's uh, always inspiring. Thank you. You as well. Once again, Nan Hayworth joining us here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. <laughs> Thanks for watching this clip of Jimmy at the Crossroads. Don't miss more engaging, intelligent talk. Subscribe today to the Jimmy at the Crossroads YouTube channel. You do not want to miss our live show. Thanks for your support. I got Jimmy at the Crossroads Making sense out of no No sense Yeah! (laughs) Yeah!